Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today involves yet another death of a young woman at a university. This is a pretty unique case in terms of the details and how everything went down. However, when I saw that this took place at the University of Utah and I saw that there were still missteps that were taken that could have prevented this entire thing, I knew that I needed to cover this case. If you recall, I did a video a while ago on another young woman named Lauren McCluskey who also went to the U and was failed by the U. This case is a lot different from Lauren's, but the undertones of the university being able to do a lot more to prevent this are still there, so I wanted to make sure I cover Chiffon's case as well. But before we get into today's case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Ritual. Did you know that the top five best-selling gut supplements with the top five best-selling brands don't include a postbiotic in their formula? Well, I have exciting news, and that is that Ritual is expanding their products and they just released their Symbiotic Plus. You may be familiar with their amazing vitamins and proteins, but they now have a three in one prebiotic, probiotic, and postbiotic. Symbiotic Plus helps support your gut, digestive, and immune health. Prebiotics help support the growth and activity of beneficial bacteria living in your gut. Probiotics are the live organisms that help relieve bloating, gas, and occasional diarrhea. And then the postbiotics provide the fuel to the cells that make up the gut lining to support the gut barrier function. Virtual uses two of the world's most clinically studied probiotics with 11 billion CFUs for digestive support. Virtual Symbiotic Plus comes in a one daily capsule that is scented with mint and a moisture controlled bottle to protect the probiotic strains without the need to refrigerate them. The capsules are also delayed release capsules that are designed to reach your colon and not just the stomach, which is the ideal place for the probiotics to survive and grow. Plus, just like all other of Ritual's amazing products, their Symbiotic Plus has a clean formula that is vegan-friendly and formulated without GMOs, without major allergens, without artificial coloring, and without animal products. Now is the time to invest in your gut. For Black Friday and Cyber Monday, Ritual is offering 40% off when you bundle with Symbiotic Plus. Make sure you use my link down below and head to ritual.com slash rs20 to get yourself on the right track this year and your gut will thank you later. Once again, make sure you use my link down below and head to ritual.com slash rs20 to get 40% off when you bundle with Symbiotic Plus. Thank you again so much to Ritual for partnering with me on today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Shifan Dong. Shifan Dong was the only child born to her parents, Jun Feng Shen and Ming Sheng Dong, in March of 2002, and she grew up in Anyang in the province of Henan, China. She was described by her parents as being smart and studious. She knew many words before even starting school, and she would often memorize entire children's books when she was a toddler. She attended the best primary school when she grew up, and she received some of the best grades in her class. For middle and high school, she attended a boarding school that only top students could get into. Her parents said that among the hundreds of students attending that school, she often ranked within the top 10. Shifan excelled in music, learning the harmonica, the flute, piano, and the halusi, a traditional instrument in China, and shortly before she died, she started picking up the pipa, which is like a Chinese lute. She also loved drawing and painting and enjoyed making magical scenes like ants lining up at a colorful scene or a deer in the middle of the forest. She also knit her own sweaters and scarves and enjoyed making bracelets and earrings. In high school, she also learned how to cook very well, becoming the president of her high school's culinary club. But most of all, Shi Fang loved to read. She loved poetry, the classics, Chinese novels, and comic books. She would often stack her books and leave them in different areas of the house when she was done with them. When she was little, her mom remembers asking her, how many books can you read in one year? And she said, from this bed to the roof. When Shifan was in high school, she realized that she wanted to move all the way to the United States to attend college. 
She applied to different schools and was accepted into the University of Utah, the University of North Carolina, and the University of New York. But ultimately, she decided on the University of Utah, which people refer to as the U, because this decision just felt right for her. So Chiffon became a part of the U's global program called Utah Global. This program helps first-year international students immerse into the university's academic and cultural life at the university. When she left, she would call or video chat her parents every single week. She said that it was mostly to check in on her cats and dogs at home, but in reality, she wanted to check in on her parents too. She would often ask them to show her the garden that she had planted at her grandmother's house to make sure the flowers and trees that she planted there were still doing okay. Almost every time she would talk to her parents, she would talk about the books that she read or new ones that she wanted to start reading or books that she wanted them to mail her. When starting school, Chiffon didn't declare a major right away. Her parents thought that maybe she might end up studying literature or maybe philosophy, but she had also talked to her parents about working in technology in Silicon Valley after she graduated, so maybe that was the path that she wanted to take. While attending the U, 19-year-old Chiffon was assigned to live with her roommate Bailey McGarland in a suite in Sage Point on the U's upper campus. On the floor above them lived a 26-year-old man named Hao Yu Wang, who was known around campus by the nickname of Chester. This is the name that he's referred to by in a lot of different university reports as well as police reports, so that is what I will be calling him throughout the remainder of the video. Chiffon and Chester met in the fall semester of 2021 and the two quickly began a relationship. Now, Chester lived in a single suite room to himself, so shortly after starting their relationship, Chiffon started spending the majority of her time in his room rather than the suite that she shared with roommates. So, Bailey said that it was normal not to see Chiffon fun for a couple of days at a time because she was basically living with Chester at that point. So for the time being, their relationship seemed pretty normal. At least Bailey didn't think anything of it because she hardly saw she fun. I also haven't heard much reported about the relationship as a whole before all of this happened, so Unfortunately, we don't really know how their relationship was as a whole before it turned bad. But during their first winter break at school, their relationship did take a turn for the worst. According to Bailey, it was at this time that Chester first started acting aggressively towards Chiffon. So, during winter break, the couple was staying in an off-campus hotel, and on January 12th, Chiffon had attempted breaking up with Chester. This caused Chester to spin into an absolute rage, so he hit her in the head with his hand so hard that she had a swollen protrusion on her head, which is referred to as a goose egg. It was also later revealed that Chiffon had told Bailey that she was trying to pack her bags and leave the hotel, and this is when Chester ran over and turned the lights off and then grabbed Chiffon around her neck and then pinned her against the wall. She tried scratching him and getting away, but this is when he began hitting her in the head. When she did ultimately flee the room, she didn't know what to do. So she went to the hotel front desk and asked the employee there to call the police for her. It was at this point that Chester was arrested and booked into the Salt Lake County Jail. The officer interviewing him noticed that his hand was pretty swollen from how hard he had hit her. When getting his side of the story, he did admit that he hit her because of a verbal argument. But after being booked in jail, Chester was released within an hour. During this time, Chiffon was also ordered a temporary protective order against Chester, but the university was not notified of this. Now, after the altercation, when she returned back to school, Chiffon told Bailey that she was worried about Chester. He did have a history of suicidal thoughts, 
and after the altercation, he had made threats against his life. So in the days after the altercation, she hadn't heard from him. He wasn't answering her calls or her text messages, and she found out that Chester's mother also hadn't heard from him in over 30 hours. So she was really starting to get worried about his well-being. So with Bailey's help, Chiffon submitted a welfare check through the HRE, which is the Housing, Residential, and Education Department at the school. She told the HRE about the altercation that took place three days prior at this point. This was the first time that HRE heard about the entire situation. So once again, it was not relayed to them by the police or anybody else. She told HRE that after this altercation, Chester threatened suicide. So she said that this, in addition to the fact that she couldn't reach him and neither could his mother, really made her worry about his safety. So the HRE asked the mental health first responders or the MH1, which is the after hours mental health program through the school, they asked them to check in on him. They attempted to do a wellness check on Chester, but they weren't able to get into contact with him. It turned out that the number that they had on file for him through the university, it actually did not work. Something happened with his phone bill not being paid or something like that. So, Chiffon gave the campus the number that she had used to get into contact with Chester through, but they also weren't able to get a hold of him through this number either. In the days that followed, MH1 followed up with both Chester and Chiffon several times, but neither of them were responding. On January 18th, they also emailed both of them, but once again, neither of them responded. The next day, the housing staff called the both of them, but still, nobody was answering. It wasn't until January 24th that housing staff finally went in person to both students' rooms. When they got to Chiffon's room, they realized that she was not there, but Bailey was. Then, when they went to go check on Chester in his room, they found that he actually was there. He told the staff that his mental health was doing a lot better, and he actually had an appointment with a mental health counselor later that day. He said that he doesn't need any further assistance. So, the staff pretty much just took his word for it, and they figured that he was going to be okay. In the days that followed, staff continued to follow up, but they just were not hearing from Chiffon. So, on January 31st, they went to her room again, and once again, she was not home, but her roommate was. The roommate this time asked the staff if she could meet up with them at a later date in a completely unrelated manner to Chiffon. So, this took place on February 5th that this meeting between Bailey and the housing staff took place. But at this point, even though it wasn't related to Chiffon, she did relay to the housing staff that she still hadn't seen Chiffon at all in the past several days. One of Chiffon's professors through Utah Global also said that Chiffon had not shown up to class in several days. So, staff looked into the swiping log on the key card that is used to access the campus residential buildings, and it showed that Chiffon had not swiped into her building in several days since January 28th. Because of this, staff attempted to call and text her again, but finally, they realized that the entire time, they had been contacting the wrong phone number. So, I guess this person, this whole time, was just getting all of these calls and text messages, and they didn't tell them until now that this was the wrong number. Once they finally got the correct number, once again, they tried calling Chiffon, but she didn't answer. Around the same time, the staff was also trying to get into contact with Hao Yu Wang one more time to check in on him. However, it turned out that the Hao Yu that they were contacting was actually a different one. There happened to be two international students with the same exact name, and I guess somehow the campus just didn't know about this. So obviously we know about this now, but at that time, they had no idea that they were contacting the wrong person. So when they called this Hao Yu and this person told them that he was fine, you know, they took his word for it and no concerns were raised. By February 6th, Bailey had confided in another friend that she had not seen her roommate in several weeks and she was really worried about her. 
but the friend said that she thinks that she actually remembers seeing Chiffon and Chester on campus. She said that she saw a girl who was crying and then there was a guy that was holding her and she was trying to leave, but the guy was not letting her. She said that this took out to her because she thought that it was wrong that this girl was crying and was clearly trying to leave, but this guy wasn't letting her. Bailey showed her friend a picture of Chiffon and Chester, and the friend confirmed that this is the couple that she saw the other day. So obviously after this sighting, it shows that Chester and Chiffon were still alive. They were still, you know, going on campus and they were still just fine. But obviously the whole situation of her crying and Chester holding her against her will, this raised a huge red flag for Bailey. So after hearing this, she contacted the HRE once again and asked them to do another wellness check on Chiffon fawn and chester so they sent her another text saying your roommate shared concern today that she hasn't seen you in a while i have some of the stage point ras try to check today but they weren't able to make contact either I just want to know if you are okay. Can you please text me back as soon as possible? And this time, Shifan did respond. She said, I'm okay. Something happened to my family and I have to deal with them. Thank you. They asked if she needed anything and she said no. Two days later on February 8th, even though they did get into contact with Shifan via text message, the HRE met with Bailey once again and she said that she still had not seen Shifan in person or called her and heard her voice or anything like that. So the HRE did decide to file a missing persons report for Shifan since nobody could actually confirm where she physically was. They were able to make contact with Chester once again and he said he was fine but at this point I don't know if this was the correct person or if it was this other international student. Part of me thinks it was the other student but either way after hearing that he was fine this report was actually reported to the University of Utah Police. The same day on February 8th an officer from the University of Utah Police Department or the UUPD met with Bailey again to ask her if she could video chat with Chiffon to see if she was okay. They didn't know if she was going to answer, but she actually did answer. She answered the FaceTime call and she showed that she was staying in a hotel off campus. In the call, she sort of gave a little virtual tour of the room that she was in and it looked like nobody else was in the room except for Chiffon. But during the FaceTime call, she would not show her face at all and she would not tell the officers where she was actually staying. So after this call, staff texted her once again saying that they've been trying to contact her for several weeks via calling, voicemail, emails, and text messages. They once again asked her to call or text them as soon as possible, and she did reply to this text once again saying, quote, my mood is a little bit bad, so I'm just resting. I will be back in school in a few days. Thank you. The staff then asked her where she is staying off campus and she found replied, I just met the person called blank, who we are assuming is a UUPD officer on FaceTime. She continues, I'm safe. I'm sorry that I don't want to meet anyone. I just want to have a good rest. The next day, the housing staff asked her once again if she would meet for an in-person interview, and once again, she declined. But she did say, though, that she will meet with them on February 11th. At this point, the housing staff decided that they needed to get into contact with Chiffon's parents to see if they knew anything else about this situation with Chiffon. So they arranged a call with Utah Global to connect with Chiffon's parents, and they basically explained to her mom that they were worried about her well-being because no one's really spoken to her, no one has seen her in person for 10 days at that point. At this point, the staff told her mom that they were worried that Chiffon is afraid to return back to the residence halls because of Chester being there. So they relate to her parents that they told Chiffon that she doesn't need to meet up with them on campus, that she can meet up for an in-person interview anywhere of her choosing. They also relate to her mom that they're worried that the reason Chiffon doesn't want to give up the location of where she is is if she's being held there against her will and she's afraid for her life if she does give up that information. 
Like I said earlier, Chiffon had not been to the residence halls since January 28th. It also showed, again, that Chester hadn't been to the residence hall either since January 25th. So this definitely raised concerns that she was with Chester whether or not it was against her will. Once again, because of the protective order, she wasn't allowed to be with him. He was not allowed to make contact with her. He wasn't even allowed in his dorm room so that she could be in her dorm room and feel safe that he wasn't nearby. So the fact that she may have been with him was not okay and it really concerned the police and the housing staff. So they urged her mother to convince Chiffon to agree to an in-person meeting with them at a location of her choice. Chiffon's mother said that she had spoken with her via video chat recently and Chiffon told her that she was fine but she was sad because of the breakup with Chester, which is totally understandable. She confirmed with the officer, though, that Chiffon will be on campus on February 11th for that meeting that she had set up. At the same time that this was going on, the UUPD also pinged her phone to see where she was, and it showed that Chiffon was in a hotel in downtown Salt Lake. So they checked all of the hotels within a one mile radius of the cell phone ping and they showed staff member photos of both Chiffon and Chester, but no one was able to identify either one of them, so they weren't able to determine the hotel that she was staying at. Then, also on February 9th, a UUPD victim's advocate reached out to Chiffon to ask her if she needed any help with the legal proceedings regarding the protection order. The officer wrote, quote, Good evening. I'm so sorry to be contacting you this late. It was 7.19 p.m. at this point. My name is Blank and I work with the University of Utah. I am the Blank of University of Utah Safety, so I'm guessing that this was blocked out just for, you know, her own identification reasons. I was notified that you have not been at your housing for a number of weeks. I also understand that you did talk to one of the University of Utah police officers today. I am checking in with you to see how you're doing and if there's anything that we can do to support you. We often work with students who have been harmed by their boyfriend or girlfriend, so we always want to make sure people are first and foremost safe and then connect with them to meet any of their needs or address any of their concerns. We support folks and help folks as they engage with the court system, help folks work with the university so if they're falling behind classes, there can be accommodations made. We support with food and clothing clothing and other basic needs, financial assistance, and even protective orders and other legal things. Anyway, I know this is a long message. I just wanted you to know that we are here and eager to connect with you and do whatever we can to support you and being a successful student and of course being healthy and well. She found replied, okay, thank you. And the officer said, would you like us to be with you at the hearing that is coming up? And she found said, thank you, but I want to do that by myself. As all of this was going on with she on, housing staff was also contacting Chester and they were able to speak with him on the phone. He had also set up a time to call and do like an actual interview on February 10th. So, on February 10th, Chester spoke with a housing administrator about the protective order, about his housing on campus, and all of that. The two spoke that morning, and basically, the housing staff member told him that because of his protective order, he is not allowed in his dorm room on campus. When they asked him about the state of his mental health, he said that he's doing so-so, so the staff member directed him to different resources for his mental health, I do also want to mention that at this point, they do have the correct phone number for Chester, so this really is Chester on the phone. This is not the other international student that was squared away and they were able to actually contact the correct person. Either way, Chester did agree with the housing staff that he would not return to his dorm room until after the court date, which was set for February 16th for the domestic violence allegations. He said that he would be staying in off-campus house housing. But when he was speaking, he was starting to become agitated and he asked the staff member who was going to pay. 
So the staff member told him that Utah Global would be able to help with financial assistance for temp housing, but he corrected the staff member by saying, no, who is going to pay for my lost reputation when I'm found innocent of being a domestic abuser? The staff member told Chester that he didn't understand, so Chester said, the police are the ones who are going to pay because they did not listen to me when I told them that I did not harm anybody. When the staff member said that that they didn't know how to make the police pay because I'm sure at this point the staff member just really didn't know what to say. Chester became irritated and said, I am living off campus by myself because I do not want to see anyone. Everyone thinks I'm a domestic abuser, so I don't want to see anyone. The HRE staff member asked him if his parents knew about the situation and he said, yes, they know everything. The staff member said that he doesn't really know how to help him and that he's happy to connect him with other campus resources. And Chester, becoming more irritated, said, you treat me like a child. If you want to help me, stop contacting me. I am grateful for your call goodbye. Then the staff member agreed not to contact him again, according to the report that was made, unless he was told to do so by a higher up. But then the next day on February 11th at 3.51 a.m., Chester sent the HRE a very, very concerning email. He basically said that the two of them were going to die by suicide together. The email reads as follows, when you see this email, Shifan and me are not in this world. Almost all people think that she hates me and are scared that she may be under my control these days or that maybe I will hurt her. But in fact, we love each other so deeply. We did quarreled and hurt each other at that night about a month ago, but that didn't change the fact that we love each other so deeply. She knows that I suffered so much because of my illness and horrible life and cannot keep going. So she decided to go with me. She was not under my control these days, although we were together. We decided to use opioids to have a painless death, so I bought heroin and fentanyl on the dark net. We planned to leave this world on February 15th, but I messed up. While we were trying the feeling that heroin brought to us, I was fine, but she got severe respiratory depression and vomited. She was unconscious during the following several hours. I didn't have the heart to see her suffering, so I injected a high dose of heroin to her, which would relieve her from her suffering. Now I am going to follow her. This world doesn't deserve her. We promised each other that we would be together in heaven forever. God will cure her and me. I swear to God that all I said in this email is true. The housing staff didn't see this email until 4.55 a.m. And of course, the housing staff called the UUPD right away. The UUPD was able to ping both Chester and Chiffon's phone by 6 a.m. to the Quality Inn in Salt Lake City. So both the UUPD as well as the Salt Lake City Police Department arrived to the hotel room. I do want to note that this hotel that they were at is one of the hotels that police previously searched when they originally pinged Chiffon's phone. So I really have no idea how they were able to suddenly track her down to this hotel room now that it was too late but they weren't able to figure it out earlier. But either way, when they got there, they found that Chester was still alive but when they attempted to provide first aid to Chiffon, they found out that she had already been deceased. After being medically evaluated and determined that he was perfectly okay, Hao Yu Wang was arrested and booked into the Salt Lake Metro Jail. After being questioned, Chester explained basically that the two initially snorted the heroin and that he fell asleep, so he didn't realize initially that Shifan had vomited. He said that when he woke up a couple of hours later, I believe, that is when he noticed that Shifan had thrown up and she was having trouble breathing. This is very, very upsetting, but when Chester was asked why he didn't call an ambulance when he noticed this, he basically said that it's because Shifan would have been hospitalized, so she wouldn't have been around to kill herself with him. He told officers that she had been unconscious but still breathing for several hours before he decided to inject her with more drugs. Upon autopsy, it was confirmed that Shifan did have substantial amounts of fentanyl and ketamine in her system. Hao Yu Wang was ultimately arrested and charged with two counts 
offense of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute and first degree murder. Now, normally I would put pictures of this person in this video, but I actually wasn't able to find any pictures of him, not his mugshot, not through the university. I couldn't find a picture anywhere, so if I'm looking in all the wrong places and you guys know where to find it, please let me know because I have no idea what he looks like, but I wasn't able to find any pictures of him. I think his name is the same as people who have written scientific journals and things like that, so I haven't been able to find pictures of him, only pictures of people with the same name who I do not believe are related to this case, so I don't wanna put in the wrong picture, but I haven't been able to find pictures that are confirmed to be him anywhere. So again, please let me know if I'm looking in all the wrong places, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't know what he looks like. I also have not seen if there have been any blood tests done on how you to see if he had injected himself with anything, and if so, how much. But just given the fact that these charges are first-degree murder makes me think that police have enough that they know that this was not a suicide pact. More so that he just killed her with the heroin or tricked her into taking it, and then he gave her a lethal dose when she was incapacitated. All I know right now is that how you is sitting in jail awaiting his trial but it remains unclear whether he's gotten a lawyer at this point or what his plea is going to be. Now, in the aftermath of Shifan's death, many people are outraged with how this was all allowed to happen. A lot of people believe that the university took a lot of missteps in this case and that Shifan's death was absolutely preventable. Once again, a lot of people have compared Shifan's death to the 2018 case of Lauren McCluskey, who once again, I did also do a video on. I covered this case, first of all, because her case does deserve to be told. There's a lot of undertones of mental health being at play here and mental health is so, so important to keep track of and keep your eye on and make sure that those around you are also doing okay. But there's also a lot that we don't know about this case still. We don't know if Chester lured her there saying like, hey, I just want to have one last conversation for closure and, you know, let's get everything out on the table so that we can leave this relationship knowing everything that we need to know and come to an amicable decision. I don't know if he held her there against her will. I don't know if she chose to be there. Clearly, there was something that she felt that she needed to hide, whether she was with Chester and she wanted to be there, but she just didn't want anybody to know about it, or whether she was being held there. We don't really know at this point. We might find out at trial, but at this point, the only people who know are Chester and Shifan, and Shifan is not here to tell us anything that happened. But the other reason I wanted to cover this case is because the U continues to admit missteps in protecting their students. Now, all of the information pretty much on the timeline of this case has been made publicly available by the university. It is very detailed, and there are at least 100 pages if anybody wants to read through them. I read through all of them and I gave you all of the relevant information that I was able to pull from these different reports. It's kind of confusing. There are different things in different places written by different people. Not all of the dates match up. Some of them are labeled a little bit weird, which I will get into in just a few minutes, but there's a lot of screenshots that are a little bit difficult to read and are a little bit out of context, so it's a little bit difficult to follow. This case definitely took a lot of, you know, elbow grease and legwork to figure out exactly where to put things, but if you do want to read that and get even more details on this case, that will be linked down below. But either way, after Shifan's death, the university's president, Taylor Randall, released a letter saying, quote, During my first year as serving as your president, I've unfortunately witnessed firsthand the pain and suffering of family, friends, and teammates of two of our students who were murdered, Aaron Lo and Shifan Dong. I sat with their families, heard the heartache in their voices, and saw their pain in their tears. No loved ones should ever have to endure such sorrow. After each immeasurable loss, I have been moved to call for change and to challenge our campus community to do more. What can the university do better to serve and protect our students, and what role can I play to ensure their safety? I have asked myself this question repeatedly over the past 11 months. Each time, I come to the same conclusion. 
listen, learn, hold people accountable, be transparent, and constantly find ways to improve. As a public university, the U has a responsibility to serve the public interest and to respect the public's rights to know in good times or bad. Of course, it's always a challenge to be fully transparent while still respecting the privacy of students, faculty, staff, and their families. But let me be clear, transparency shines a bright spotlight on our actions. Only by seeing can we improve. Regarding the death of first-year student Shifan Dong this past February at the hands of fellow student Hao Yu Wang, I believe the university must err on the side of full transparency. Today, the university released a detailed timeline of our employees' actions before and as a result of her passing, including knowing public information related to this case and documents that would ultimately be subject to disclosure under public records laws and policies. While we have been actively working on honest and comprehensive self-evaluation of the university's actions prior to Dong's death since late February, we delayed the release of a detailed timeline and related documentation and information to protect a pending criminal case. Let me be clear, the university's examination of the matter and the resulting accountability actions have been ongoing. Although the university has made extensive efforts to support and ensure the safety of Dong and provide assistance to Wang, our self-evaluation revealed shortcomings. A delay by former members of our housing services staff in notifying the University of Utah Police Department of indications of intimate partner violence processes, procedures, and training and housing that need to be clarified and improved, and insufficient and unprofessional internal communication. We have addressed each of these areas, including employment actions. In addition to holding employees accountable, we have updated and clarified emergency procedure for housing staff and restructured the organizational approach to streamline the reporting process, hired a new housing executive director, refined processes for communications between housing staff and university police, and implemented regular audits of conduct, racism, and biased incidents in university-managed housing. In addition, since the tragic murder of Lauren McCluskey in 2018, the U has made broad sweeping changes to our safety practices to better ensure our students' safety. We have completely transformed the University of Utah public safety based on the recommendations of experts and the most recent state audit of our police department. These improvements include, but are not limited to, establishing a new chief safety officer position, recruiting new police officers, more than 90% are new since 2019, creating more robust and thorough investigative practices, enhancing training on interpersonal violence intervention, investing in new public safety facilities and equipment, developing a public-facing dashboard, and establishing a center for research on improving campus safety. When it comes to improving, when it comes to protecting our students, our job is never done. I've challenged university senior leaders to leave no stone unturned as we seek additional ways to enhance student safety, and I encourage all of you to do the same, every student, staff member, and faculty. We must always actively prioritize the health and well-being of the students entrusted to our care. As your president, I will lead through transparency by taking action and by constantly seeking to do better. You have my commitment, and I ask the same commitment of you. Taylor R. Randall, president. So with that entire letter, let's review some of the missteps that have been identified in this case. First, it came out that when they were calling How You in the initial stages of the investigation, they were using the phone number that they knew didn't work instead of the one that Shifan had provided for them. They were only able to get into contact with How You physically when they went to his dorm room almost two weeks after the initial report of domestic violence. They made this contact on February 24th and his housing card wasn't swiped since February 25th, but they didn't know that for several weeks. It seems that after how you found out that the university was looking into him, that is when he stopped showing up. Then after this in-person contact, when they thought that they got a hold of how you on the phone, it was a completely different person. I honestly don't understand how this mess up was made. I don't see how when you search their name in the university directory, you know, two people would have popped up. I can definitely see how they would have mixed up both students, maybe tried to contact both of them to make sure they, you know, got the right person. But they said, the university said, that they didn't even know that there were two students with the same name. So when they typed in his name, did it just not pop up? Did only one pop up? At that point, that would be understandable and you can't really get mad about that. But I don't think that that's what happened. I think that two names popped up and they just chose the wrong one. Again, I could be wrong. 
you know, but I honestly don't understand how they didn't know. They had no idea that there were two students with the same name. Then we know that nobody really even put in the actual legwork of trying to physically locate Chiffon until 10 days after her original report. They didn't even know until February 7th that she hadn't been on campus since January 28th. You would think that with how many times they went to her dorm room throughout that period of time and she just wasn't there, that this would be one of the first things that they would check to see if she was even at the dorms to begin with or if she was returning to begin with. They knew that it was possible that how you was breaking his protective order by visiting Chiffon and being in a hotel room with her, yet there were no real concerns made for this other than mentioning it to Chiffon's mother. We also know that they didn't put out a missing persons report for how you after their initial contact with him on the 24th. He was pretty much in the same position as Shifan. They had only contacted him via the phone and they didn't know his physical location after seeing him in his dorm room that one time. They also knew that he got very agitated on the phone with the housing staff and he made threatening statements like, who is going to pay for my ruined reputation? So why wasn't a missing persons report made for him as well? Because again, we know that Chiffon could have been in danger. She's the one that caused his ruined reputation. Obviously, I know that he caused his own ruined reputation, but when we're dealing with a situation like this, in his mind, she is the one that caused him to have this ruined reputation as a domestic abuser. So why was this not taken more seriously? Why, after him saying, someone's gonna pay for this, someone's gonna pay for my ruined reputation, I don't wanna talk to anybody because someone ruined my reputation as being a domestic abuser. Why was nothing done about this? This is the biggest thing that stands out to me, the fact that he was making threatening statements like this. I understand that the housing staff member didn't really know how to respond, they didn't really know what to say in relation to this, but given that he was agitated and given that he was saying, who is going to pay? The police is going to pay. The whoever is going to pay. They should have known that this was a threatening statement and they should have reported this to somebody. Instead, all they said was, yeah, he asked me not to contact him, so I'm not going to unless someone tells me to. In my opinion, that was a huge misstep. It's very, very clear at this time that he's agitated, that he's looking for somebody to blame the situation on and that he's not in a good mental state. So I definitely feel like this is something that could have been handled a lot better in terms of this phone call alone. Even if everything else happened, if something was done about this phone call, this whole case may have turned out differently. So now moving on to other missteps that were taken, the university also talked about unprofessional communication between staff members within the dean's office and Utah Global. Screenshots of these conversations are available in the documents that they released. Again, some of them are a little bit confusing, out of order, out of context, but there were a lot of things that I noticed about these communications and the reports that they wrote as well. I personally noticed that they mixed up Dong and Wang multiple times on their reports. There was one report, and you'll find it, you'll find it in this, where they mixed up their names for the entirety of the report, basically, you know, saying that Dong is the abuser and that Wang is the missing person. It is crossed off and corrected by hand, but still, the person typing this initial report didn't even know who was who. Then there are other areas of reports where the names are referred to as Dang and Wong, once again, mixing up their names. Obviously, it's understandable to happen once or twice throughout reports, but to have it happen again and again and again just shows a sort of unconscious bias against these last names that, you know, maybe to some people may sound similar, but they are completely different last names. Then after speaking with Shifan's mother on February 9th, they sort of mocked her for not understanding the gravity of the situation that they thought her daughter was in. As a reminder, there is a very big language barrier. They had to use a translator in the call and, you know, I've used translators before for a lot of different patients in my area of work and a lot of things get missed in translation. You know, the translator sometimes is just summarizing what the person says. So, 
the gravity of a situation can definitely be misinterpreted. Some things can get mixed up in translation. Some things can be worded a little bit differently to make it so the other person doesn't quite understand, you know, every detail of the situation. They just sort of understand the summary of what's going on. One employee wrote in a text, kind of sad how the whole concept of domestic violence barely registered with the mom. And then they sent a facepalm emoji and added, but what can we do? Then there's another conversation where someone texted, what's this about a missing student? And the replies are redacted, but then you can see a couple of replies later that there's a laughing emoji, which is obviously completely unprofessional and unacceptable when talking about such a serious situation like somebody who could be in danger of losing her life. Then during the investigation, there was a UUPD officer who was the victim's advocate who had made contact with Shifan. This person was the one who texted her that I read earlier. This officer was asked, you know, how things were going with Dong and she said that she didn't know who Dong was. Again, it was also said that the Salt Lake Police never informed the university about the protective order against Hao Yu and they said that it was Shifan's responsibility to tell the university. But once again, did anybody inform her of this? We don't really know, but we also know that she spoke broken English and she had a little bit of trouble communicating with people. That's why earlier in the video when I said that, you know, Bailey was helping her make this wellness check on uh, Chester, it was because of, you know, a little bit of a language barrier. She did have a little bit of trouble communicating with people and her English was a little bit broken. So, was this information relate to her? Did they make sure that she understood that it was her responsibility or was this just yet another thing that was lost in translation? Then, as we know, the UUPD tried multiple times to contact both students and their parents. They were able to make contact with Shifan's parents but they weren't able to make contact with Haoyu's parents. Why? Because they contacted the other student's parents. So, another missed opportunity. Then, as I stated before, police weren't able to trace Shifan's phone to the hotel that she was at while she was staying there. But after they died, they magically figured out exactly what hotel she was at. If you know more about this, please let me know because I have no idea why they weren't able to find her hotel based on the ping when she was still alive. But after she died, they were suddenly able to find it. That makes no sense to me, especially because they had already gone to the hotel once and, you know, confirmed that they weren't there. I do understand that there were staff members who said that they did not recognize these people, but I don't know how much effort was put into looking up the records to see if anybody by, you know, those names were staying there, anything like that. So, I don't know how that was missed, but once again, another missed opportunity to intervene. I also don't know if they pinged Haoyu's phone to see if him and Shifan were together, Maybe they pinged the other student's phone. I don't know. I don't know if it's because maybe there was no missing persons report for how you, so they didn't have, you know, the access to ping his phone because once again, there was no like official report that he's a missing person. So maybe having both of their phones to ping narrowed it down to this one hotel. Maybe, you know, they weren't able to ping Chester's phones originally. I don't really know, but they weren't able to ping his phone to see if they were together because there was no missing persons report. So, once again, just yet another thing that they could have done to streamline this whole process and to make sure that they were able to intervene. Because of these missteps, the university said that they have taken action. Now, they did never release the identities of these employees who were being looked into or what their titles are, i.e. if they're directors, students, etc. But they have written letters to two staff members described as final written notice letters. These letters stated that they failed to follow policy and procedure for mandatory reporting and that they will need to undergo further training. A third staff member was also written a letter of expectation, which is said to not be as severe as a letter of final notice. The university also pointed to the fact that they are very understaffed Many of the employees in the housing positions quit right before break and at the time that all of this was going on, they said that 11 of their 19 positions were open. So, 
not being filled. They also identified that there were staff members who were not aware of who is supposed to report domestic violence or suicidal ideation and when. Nobody is assigned specific roles for this. They also don't understand the difference between a wellness check and a welfare check with a welfare check being the more emergent one. Basically, they said that these employees don't know who was supposed to respond or how they're supposed to respond in an emergent situation. So, the university said that they've completely revamped their training to be more specific for these types of situations. In the aftermath of Shifan's death, her family also retained the law firm of Parker and McConkey to represent them in relation to the missteps taken by the U. This was the same firm that represented the McCluskey family. The attorney in this case states, quote, the University of Utah failed Chiffon and her family, allowing her to be needlessly killed by another student who was known to have violently assaulted her only weeks before. Especially after professing to have learned from Lauren McCluskey's death, it is inexcusable that the university continues to make the same mistakes with the same tragic consequences. This comes down to the human factor and training, quite honestly. And the training needs to be clearer. In this case, we thought that the training was clear. For whatever reason, the employees didn't react the way they should have. It's incredibly frustrating, and the consequences are extremely significant. The university has said that they have taken steps to resolve the issue after Lauren's death, but an audit of the housing on campus done earlier this year actually revealed that many of those same issues still have not been addressed. There have been many other situations that happened on campus that could have turned out lethal that were not reported to the police. One was a student who reported to the campus that she was threatened with a weapon and that her life was in immediate danger but the police were not informed of this until 24 hours later. While the university says that they are striving to make improvements, Shifan's family is not satisfied. They've lost their only child, their only daughter. Her death could have been prevented, but because of these missteps, yet another life was taken. I can't even imagine not just the heartbreak for Shifan's family, but the stress that they must be under being thousands of miles away and being able to do almost nothing. Then the language barrier adds yet another roadblock in this case. They trusted the university with their daughter's safety since they knew that her only family was all the way back in China and they still failed and the family is now dealing with the consequences of all of that. So that is all of the information that I have for today's case. I am so frustrated at the fact that we have yet another case where the correct actions just were not taken for one reason or another. Part of me thinks that because of the language barrier, people just did not put in the effort to wanting to understand what somebody was trying to tell them because of their accent or because of their broken English or because of whatever other reason. I really do think that the situation was not stressed as much as they thought it was to Shifan's mother because of the language barrier. I also think that it was difficult to communicate with Shifan because of the language barrier. So I think more effort should have been put in to understanding what her mindset was, what she was going through, where she was, and everything like that. Personally, I think that she was dealing with a lot and she didn't want to talk to anybody, but I think if more effort was put into actually understanding what she was going through, maybe she would have been more willing to talk. But again, we don't know. We don't know if she was held there against her will and she was afraid to talk. We don't know the situation. So, we do know that both Shifan and Haoyu struggled with their mental health. We know that that's a factor in this case. We know that the both of them had suicidal ideation. They both had these histories of depression. So, given that mix, it's just not a good combination for them. And I think Shifan knew that. I think Shifan knew that she couldn't be in a relationship with someone like Chester because of her own mental health. She can't be dealing with the things that he was putting her through. In my opinion, once again, given that both Shifan and Haoyu were dealing with these mental health issues, I think that he lured her to the hotel and didn't let her leave. 
I think that after this contact with both of them was made where, you know, the housing staff visited him at his dorm room, I think that how you realized that the walls were closing in on him and people were checking in on him and that they would figure out a way to keep him away from Chiffon. So I think to prevent her from getting away and to prevent the university from intervening because I think the fact that she died on the same day in the early morning hours that she was supposed to show back up and have this in-person meeting, that says a lot. That says everything we need to know about why she was injected with heroin and why she died from it. I don't think it's a coincidence that she was supposed to meet up with someone in person on the same day that she died. That's not a coincidence. That is purposeful and I think that shows his intent to keep her away from anybody who might be able to help her. Whether, once again, it was because you know, he didn't want to lose her because she was going to leave him. Or maybe it was because he also wanted her to suffer like he was suffering. You know, maybe he thought in this own twisted way that they could suffer together and that made them stronger and that made them, you know, better, whatever. I don't really know. I do think that if she did have such struggles with depression that maybe he, you know, presented this idea to her as a way to just, you know, numb your feelings for a little bit before going back into the real world. I definitely could see how that would have lured her into this situation, but no matter how it went, I think that once he got her to the point where she was incapacitated and could not fight him back, that is when he finished the job and killed her, and once again, I do think it was premeditated, and I do think it was purposeful. Once again, the fact that she died the same day that she was meant to meet up with somebody in person, and the fact that he bought these drugs on the dark web says everything that I need to know. He ordered these drugs online, and he had them delivered to the hotel. I imagine it couldn't have been that fast, so this obviously was planned ahead of time. So, in my humble opinion, I think that this was an intentional killing. I don't think this was a suicide pact. I think Chiffon would have reached out to her family. I think she would have done other things to make sure that other ducks are in a row before she chose to take her life. I don't think she did choose to take her life, but I do think that if she was in that mental state where she did, I think she would have said her goodbyes to her family at the very least. But I do think if this goes to trial, we will find out a lot more about the whole situation, what kind of mental state she seemed to be in, whether she was there willingly, whether she took any drugs willingly, or if this was all against her will. I think all of that will come out if there is a trial. If he pleads guilty, I don't know if we're ever going to know this information. But with that, I do want to hear what all of you guys have to say about this case. If there is a trial, of course, I will keep you all updated on what happens there. But for now, we are left with so many questions and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that this was a suicide pact and that Chester just happened to live? Do you think that he murdered her and what do you think his reason was? Do you think that the steps taken by the university and the university police were appropriate? And if not, what do you think they could have done to prevent this? Let's discuss these and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. But with that, if you liked this video, make sure you go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you use my link down below and head to ritual.com rs20 and get 40% off when you bundle with Symbiotic Plus. Make sure you follow my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, I now have a form that you can submit down below. Please use that. I think it's going to make things a lot more streamlined. So again, if you do have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to submit the form down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.